Good morning, Brew Daily Show. I am Neil Fryman. And I'm Toby Howell. Toby, it's it's Friday, and we're going to open every Friday show with a round of Fast Week, Slow Week. So, Toby, Fast Week, Slow Week. Yeah, we were talking before the show today. Last week was definitely a slow week, and it's because it was a full week coming off of a, a shortened week the week prior. But so, this week, in comparison to last week, has definitely been a fast week. It's really flown by for me. All right, I'm Fast Week, too. You're Fast Week. Next time, I just need a shorter answer. From you. Okay. Well, I had <laughs> to a lot of explanation. I had to set up the segment. For, it's got to be a people. gut. It's got to be a gut reaction. Okay. Fast week. Fast, fast week. week for me. All right. So put us down two fast weeks. Uh, and then also just a quick uh, moment to note that if you've been enjoying this podcast, we'd love for you to make sure you're subscribed. So whether you listen on Spotify or Apple, just hit that little subscribe button. It helps us out a lot. And if you've really been enjoying the podcast, maybe send it to one of your pals. Send it to one of your buds that you think would would enjoy a quick news rundown every morning. Morning, so great job, Toby. That was Good my pitch. plug. That was my plug. Speaking of a news rundown, give a little preview of what we're about to talk about. And it is, man, it was a newsy day, uh, and as well as yesterday, as well as today. So the jobs report was just released this morning. We'll get into those numbers. We'll do our Friday segment of stock of the week, dog of the week, and then an Oscars preview because that is happening on Sunday. It's a great show today. But first, I want to start with this massive wipeout in the banking sector. Uh, if you have a lot of bank stocks in your Robinhood account, I would just say. You know, maybe don't open it because the bank index just had its biggest one day drop since the pandemic began nearly three years ago. So it's not just the US either. This banking route spread across the world. So what sparked it? There's a crisis engulfing Silicon Valley Bank. Have you heard of it? SVB, baby. A lot of people hadn't heard of this. Yeah. It lost 60% yesterday and opened trading down another 66% today. So, what is it? Don't think too hard. It's literally the de facto bank of Silicon Valley. Uh, it works with a bunch of startups out there. In fact, I think more than half of tech and life sciences US startups work with Silicon Valley Bank. So, Toby, I know you were glued to this story yesterday as it was unfolding yeah. on the internet. So, I would love for. To help you break it down. So, for anyone on Twitter, in kind of like the, the tech bro Twitter circle, you couldn't scroll two tweets without seeing uh, something breaking down the SVB situation. So, I'm going to do my best to kind of give some context of like why SVB kind of imploded. So, if we go back to uh, 2019, 2020, it is a boom time for startups, especially those raising venture capital, and so which means that deposits at SVB jumped from 61 billion at the end of 2019 to 190 by the end of 2021. So all of a sudden, SVB is sitting on all this excess cash on their books. So this is startups doing really well, throwing their cash into SVB. Right. Okay. The yeah, venture capitalists were funding these startups. Startups are like, oh, we have right. all this cash, crazy boom, put it in the bank. And so SVB is sitting with all this excess deposits, and they're like, what should we do with it? So they did what they thought was the rational thing and locked it up into these long term 10 plus year, actually mortgage backed security bonds, and that yielded 1.5%. And that's a key number because at the time, that is a decent return, like 1.5% on $80 billion. Yeah, is interest a lot. rates were. Yeah, really low. Really low at the time, but in the in the uh, years since, interest rates have slowly begun to rise. Actually, quickly begin to yeah. rise, and so now that money sitting yielding one and a half percent doesn't look so good anymore. And so, the other thing that happened too is deposits started falling. Like we're not in this crazy boom right. time anymore, and so uh, SVB actually started selling off some of their book, like available for sale bonds, and taking like a little bit of a loss on those sales as well. So not only is their big chunk of money sitting there not yielding as much, but they're also having to sell some of them to cover some of this lack of deposits. All of that is combined to make people really, really nervous. Right, and I think what sparked the big stock sale or the stock white about yesterday was they needed to raise money. Right. They, they launched a share sale to raise $2 billion, and it spooked the crap out of everyone. And then you had some of these founder, some of these VCs like uh, Peter Thiel's Founders Fund and a bunch of other of the mega VCs out there telling their founders that maybe you want to get out your money from SVB. And now our, like the discourse today is all about whether we're about to see a bank run. Right. And the problem with situations like this is something called like asymmetric upside where even if the chance that 
uh, SVB might go under and you lose the money you have in there is like 1%, there's no real mm-hmm. reason to keep your money in there yeah. because there are alternatives that are safer. And so that's kind of how a bank run starts, where a lot of people start thinking in the same lines of thinking of, hey, even if this thing might go under, let's just get out while yeah. we can. So we'll see whether uh, there, <laughs> a bank run does happen today. It's a very fluid situation and everything could change yeah. in hours. Um, but what was interesting is whether this is going to spread to the broader banking sector. And from what we've read earlier, it seems like this is kind of an SVB situation, and it's not necessarily this contagion that will spread across. Right. It's not this canary in a coal mine for the global banking sector. They're just a little spooked yesterday, so I don't think there's any sort of crazy yeah. uh, shenanigans going no, on. I'm going to be on, on Twitter across. all day kind all right. of monitoring the situation. Well, so. Hopefully, we don't have to talk about it on Monday, because yeah. things will have calmed down, but who knows. For sure. Uh, I want to go to the labor market. The jobs report was out this morning, and for the 10th time in 11 months, the jobs report topped expectations. So the labor market just keeps rolling. This is pretty crazy. The U.S. added 311,000 jobs in February compared to expectations of 215,000. And we're in this world where a hot labor market would necessarily would kind of tank stocks because it would mean the Fed would have to raise interest rates higher. But that's not happening this morning because there's a few hints that there is some softening. The biggest one is wage gains only increase just a little bit. So that is really good news for inflation. Right. It is, again, we've said this multiple times, such a weird <laughs> economy and market we're in right now where we were all nervously awaiting the jobs report to make sure it wasn't too good. Yeah. Because that would mean, yeah, rates would probably have to be hiked uh, even quicker. But yeah, some of the other indicators or some of the key things that we picked up is that hospitality sector is also still in like a labor crunch. They still need people. Restaurants need workers. Hospitality needs workers. Um, and then this is another fun little tidbit that came out actually before the jobs report, which shows how tight the labor market might be. A Montana, Montana-based construction firm told the Minneapolis Fed that it's actually hiring a private jet to fly construction workers to where they're needed rather than hire new employees. What a crazy, crazy <laughs> indicator of where we're at in it the is, labor it, market. It's, it is interesting to see the sector by sector breakdown where tech is in this really bear market. And then leisure and hospitality, they let they've been leading the jobs gains for, you know, I think years now. They got gutted during the pandemic and now they just can't hire fast enough. Sixty percent of all restaurants are can't find enough workers. And we know that ahead of burrito season, Chipotle is hiring yeah. fifteen thousand workers. It is crazy. Remember we we saw the headlines of Amazon. Amazon hiring 100,000 workers. Yeah. Now it is, it's totally flipped. Totally flipped. Amazon's laying off all the workers. Chipotle's the one leading the, mar- the charge now. So, yeah. So, if I had to sum up big picture for, the la- for this jobs report, it seems that it was good. Like, yeah. for, it was good for workers because more people got jobs, 311,000. And it was also good for the Fed because the unemployment rate ticked up a little bit. There were signs of some softening. So, uh, that's why you kind probably see yeah. it. Was, it's what they call maybe like a Goldilocks scenario. That's yeah. kind of a big stock market term. For sure. Uh, so that's why you'll probably see stock market in the green today. That's another great look at the macro environment we're in. Um, I also want to take a look kind of at a macro environment story. Biden released his budget proposal yesterday, and it's always a fun day to kind of like peer through and see what nuggets are in, in the proposed budget. So I'm going to just take us through some of the nuggets and then toss it over to you, Neil, to kind of hear your thoughts on it. So nugget number one is that Biden wants to expand the $35 cap on insulin prices. That's a story that we've been talking about mm-hmm. over the last few, few weeks. Um, so that's actually within the budget. Number two, nugget number two is the budget would boost military spending to $835 billion, which is one of the largest peacetime expenditures in history. It's weird to say peacetime, because it yeah. does feel like we are kind of at war. Not really. So that's an interesting nugget uh, within the budget. And then the overall goal of this is to reduce uh, $3 trillion in spending to try to cut into that federal deficit. So the, that's like the high-level picture. Um, but yeah, Neil, what do you what do you make of this? Budget? My takeaways is that uh, this is higher 
like this is his wish list for higher taxes. Right. So we wrote in the brew this morning that, and if you have a couch that's not pushed up against the wall, I love that line. You're probably not going to have. Or you're probably going to see your uh, taxes increase. So uh, he wants to raise the corporate tax rate from 21 percent currently to 28 percent. Increase capital gains taxes, which is your profits on asset sales. Quadruple the tax on stock buybacks, and he talked about that in the State of the Union. And then tax hike on income more than four hundred thousand dollars to pour back into Medicare. So that's how he said he would pay for this and reduce the deficit. But we should be clear about when talking about this budget. It is a proposal. This is like the start of negotiation. So when you go to your boss and they're like, you know, let you know, what are you thinking for your raise? What are you thinking for your salary? And you just throw a number out there to anchor the conversation. Uh, I didn't take a negotiation class. So <laughs> I, this I don't is what know I if that's assume. how you're supposed to do it. I think you're supposed to anchor. <laughs> OK. Well, I think that's I've good. heard that term. So you're supposed to anchor. And this is what Biden is is doing because the GOP controls the House. And honestly, very few of this, if any, will be passed. But it basically just stakes out your position to begin negotiations. And also, he's going to run for president again. So he'll just campaign on all of these priorities that he just laid out. Right. Yeah. It's more. It by the time that this budget, if it gets passed at all, it's going to look a lot different. But it is it is fun to see kind of where the administration's priorities are at right now. Um, and then, yeah, you you hit on all all the tax stuff as well. That's also yeah. He use you use the budget in order to justify like these your your tax agenda as well. So I, it's always fun. I it's an interesting business story every every time it comes out. All right, back with another edition of our favorite. Favorite Friday segment, Stock of the Week, Dog of the Week. First, we're going to tell you about a Stock of the Week that's been crushing it over the last week, and then take you into Dog of the Week. We've actually gotten some comments that people are disappointed that Dog of the Week wasn't an actual dog. So maybe we should put in a I dog know, in so there, we too. Might, we might loop in some actual dog content, but just to be clear, the reason why we call it Dog of the Week <laughs> is there's a thing on Wall Street called the, the dog of the, the Dow, the dog of the Dow, which is just a stock that's not the worst performing stock of the Dow ever. Year. Doing well, and so that's why we call it Dog of the Week. We'll but just switch it to Dogs of the Week, and then we'll get in a stock and a little yeah, club. a little corgi or two. So Neil, what is the stock of the week? All right, I get to do stock of the week this week, and I picked Weight Watchers or WW, the, the company formerly known as Weight Watchers. <laughs> WW, they did a little rebrand. They're up 26 percent this week because they're hopping on the health trend of the moment, which is these obesity, diabetes drugs, Ozempic, Wegovy. Uh, earlier this week, WW. W, well, why am I saying that? Weight Watchers. I hate saying WW. <laughs> Weight Watchers said it was buying the digital health company Sequence, which is a subscription service that pairs patients with doctors uh, that prescribe these drugs that are absolutely blowing up. CEO Seema Sistani of Weight Watchers said, this is the biggest innovation in our industry today. So she is not going to let that this pass her by. Yeah. We've seen quotes, too, that this could be this kind of category of drugs could become the best selling drug in history. So honestly, I, very bullish on, on Weight Watchers, for sure, WW. Um, because yeah, if they can capture some of that market, some of the, some of the market up. of the best selling drug of all time, obviously, you're not yet, sell. but maybe because it really significantly drops your weight. And it, it, there's been detrimental effects because people who don't have diabetes are getting are buying all this up and leading to shortages. Right. Yeah. We, we hit on that story. Uh, I think it was last week at this mm -hmm. point. But yeah, I, I assume someone's going to come out with a branded drug just for weight, uh, cutting weight yeah. specifically. So Weight Watchers, stock of the week to watch. Um, all right, let's go to dog of the week. Dog of the Week is actually another bird, or it's another animal. It's all birds, the environmentally sustainable casual footwear brand that kind of first rose to prominence uh, in like the tech bro culture. A lot of Silicon Valley uh, people were wearing it into the office. But it's down over 20% in the last week. And honestly, there's a laundry list of why it happened. Just from a pure reactions to earnings standpoint, it had a really bad holiday season. The CEO actually called it a promotion-y holiday season where they laid out too many deals, so like sales didn't come in as high as they expected. But there's also a bunch of strategy missteps. One of them is, like many of these DTC brands, they expanded their real retail footprint a little too aggressively. Yeah. They tr opened too many brick and mortar 
hardware stores. And then two. Hold on, before you say this, I got to tell people that when we first saw that Allbirds was doing bad, you out of the blue said, I know exactly why they're doing poorly. And then you read the article later, and the CEO said the exact same thing. So right. I just want. I just want to thank you for giving me my laurels. But yeah, leading into that, when I heard Allbirds was doing badly, I was like, oh, well, they released this running shoe for elite runners that did really poorly, and the running community kind of hated. It's not a good running shoe. It is like, I'll I'll tell you one of the things that the running community hates: the laces. The Mm. laces come untied, and it that is the quickest way to alienate a runner if you can't even get the laces right. Which it just shows that Alberts was in over their head, kind of moving into this new sector. And the CEO is like, "Yeah, we definitely had a misstep. Mm -hmm. It it didn't have the reaction we we wanted." So my advice to Alberts: stay in your lane. You were a comfy, casual shoe that you could wear in the office. Don't try to pick up these. Elite runner uh, segment, yeah. Wow, you should. Why are you doing a podcast? You should freaking go work at Alberts. I know, seriously. If you're listening, Alberts. Also, disclaimer: none of that was financial advice. This is just us talking stocks. That's my favorite part every week. Um, all right, let's look ahead to the weekend. The Oscars are coming up. Uh, there's a few directions that we can go in. First of all, we were just remarking, crazy. It's been one year since the slap. Yeah. Feels like a lifetime ago, but also feels like it just happened. Um, I'll never forget, I got a slack from our copy editor, Holly, being like, oh my bleeping God, uh, Will Smith just slapped Chris Rock. Like, <laughs> that is forever in burned in my letter. memory, because yeah. I wasn't watching it at the time. Yeah, that crazy time. Uh, but so there's a few different directions we can go when talking about the Oscars. I actually want to go into the Oscars are constantly trying to reinvent invent themselves. They're constantly trying to recapture the intention that they once had. So I want to talk about the TikTokification of the Oscars this year. One quick note, the Academy Award is actually going to post their acceptance speeches in the six biggest categories, almost in real time on TikTok and Facebook. So they're trying to get that content out there Mm -hmm. ASAP. And Neil, I know you have some thoughts on, and you're relatively bullish on this kind of move for the Oscars. I mean, it's smart. Uh I'm not on TikTok a lot, but every time I've been on TikTok in the last few months, I feel like I see an acceptance award speech. There was a bunch at the Golden Globes, and you know, they there are like very bite-sized, snackable, emotional moments that people give in these speeches, and you don't have to watch the whole thing. Right. And TikTok will allow you to just break it up and see the most interesting moments. Then there's the behind-the-scenes stuff that is captured, also captured on TikTok, like Ben Affleck, you know, looking all pissed when someone. Right. Right. interviewing Jennifer Lopez at the Golden yeah. Globes and I just saw like Nathan Fielder giving an acceptance speech at some random award show. So from that, I don't know, it does seem like that award shows while people aren't watching them on cable or whatever anymore have a really long shelf life and a second life on social media yeah. and I think it's really smart of the Oscars to tap it. Lead into so, it. Yeah. you know, maybe TikTok can breathe new life into the Oscars yeah. that were kind of left for dead. Okay, but obviously we're going to have to put in some Oscars picks yes. to, to hold us accountable. Neil, do you want to take us through the categories? I saw a couple. Um, yes, yeah, so let's go Best Picture. But first, I, some actual news around Best Picture. For the first time, they're including, a, not for the first time, but there is an unusual amount of blockbusters for Best right. Picture. Right. There's Avatar, there's Elvis, there's Top Gun Maverick. Um, and so it's not these like little art house films that n- nobody's seen, which are they're very good. But um, yeah. maybe this is a better strategy as well to lean into the blockbusters. So my Best Picture pick is The Banshees of Inishirin. Which I saw and I liked it. So um, that's a good pick. You're very cultured. Mine's less cultured. <laughs> Top Gun Maverick, <laughs> Let's baby. Go. Let's go. It was actually. It's also the enjoyable. only one you saw. It's the only one I saw. I actually saw Avatar too. I will say that. I um, I like Tar better than Banshees, but I think Banshees will win. That's why I picked it. Okay. Good I'm being. Piece. I'm being. Okay. Ready? Best actress. <laughs> this is really tough for me. I haven't seen any of the movies that are in, so I'm going with Tar because you liked it, Kate Blanchett. So I think that's probably going to be your pick as okay, well. Okay, right? this is getting like two levels deep of, of reverse psychology. I know. I'll go Michelle Yeoh from Everything Everywhere All at Once. She's been everywhere. I also haven't seen it, but it seems like she's going to win. She's probably. I'm just win. picking up on vibes. Yes, good. Okay, best actor. <laughs> okay, again, haven't seen much. I'm going to go with the controversial one and do Austin Butler from Elvis because I hate that. He 
he still has the Elvis voice. Like he changed his voice to play Elvis. And I'm just gonna pick it because I respect the commitment to the craft. I'm gonna go with Brendan Fraser for the, the whale. whale because I remember he everyone just started he just started crying at the uh, the standing ovation at Sundance and our social media guy uh, Liam loves making Brendan Fraser memes. So these are good picks. Yeah. Very well informed. <laughs> he is. I feel like he's the favorite. All right, final one. Best original song. I want to do the. Uh, I actually forgot the name of it, but the song from RRR. Yeah. Um, RRR was actually the greatest. It's called Yatu Yatu. Um, my favorite movie that I've seen this year. It's a three-hour epic yeah. about two friends. Uh, it's it's an international film out of India, and I it is so good. I yeah. cannot explain to you how good it is. So please go watch it. One of my favorite movies is a Bollywood movie, Three Idiots. That's also like three and a half hours long, and it goes from comedy to right. to tragedy, and then back to comedy, it's, and then they start singing, and it's like this all-encompassing event, and it's so good. So I, I can't believe I haven't watched more, but yeah. now I'll have to watch RR. Check it out. My yeah. original song is uh, I'm going Lady Gaga. Hold my hand. Never heard of it, but it seems it sounds good. <laughs> we are. Uh, the, the, that's your informed but uninformed Oscars takes from Toby and Neil. All there right. So uh, we'll check on those on Sunday night and Monday for the pod. Uh, our final story. I know there's a lot going on this weekend, but one thing you could do is also check out the World Baseball Classic. For the first time in six years, uh, this tournament is back, and it pits 20 different countries against each other in a sort of World Cup style baseball event, and a lot of the best players in the world are playing <laughs> but a lot of the best players are not on the Czech team which is one of the main storylines because the Czech team is pretty good but none of them or very few of them actually play professional baseball they all have day jobs so there's a firefighter there's a financial a analyst there's an auditor there's a high school teacher the manager is a neurologist it's so good so tomorrow a firefighter is going to pitch a firefighter from Czech Republic is going to pitch to Shohei Otani who's this Babe Ruth character who's getting paid 30 million dollars a year, so I'm kind of looking forward to that. People love these stories. Whenever you hear about a professional athlete with a day job, some of the other times I've heard this uh, is like the backup backup goalies in yeah. NHL games are sometimes like people who are sitting in the crowd like the day before. Uh, and then there was also in the tennis world a uh, Croatian like Monday qualifier who has a day job, has an MBA from Harvard, is a real estate professional, actually beat a like a former top ten player in the world coming in. I remember that. So it is just the best feel-good stories when these like everyday guys kind of step in and and, and yeah. dominate on the world stage. So we'll see. Japan is nasty, and they're probably going to be. They're probably going to be. Czech. Them, but but while we're on the subject of Czech people, I just want to say the word Yarmir Yager, <laughs> the, the hockey player. the hockey player. Great, just name. such a good name, Absolutely. Yarmir Yager. Good guy. All right, uh, I think that's a wrap from us for the week. Was this our third week? Third week and wow. a fast one. I would give a reminder to everyone to change their clocks on Sunday morning, but we don't really do that anymore. Apple's Except got on your microwave. Taken care of. Uh, uh, remember, we want to hear from you, so make sure you email us at morningbrewdaily at morningbrew.com and definitely share this with all your friends. want to give out to our sh a shout-out to our awesome crew. Our producer and editor is Emily Milliron. Our technical director is Elias Alba. Supervising producer is Bryce Beloff. Show's guitar slayer is Dan Bauza. Hair and makeup is playing shortstop for the Czech national team. Devin Emery is our chief content officer. Our show is a production of Morning Brew. Great show. Great week. We'll see you on Monday. Mm -hmm.